Welcome to Fridays with the Fellows from the Oklahoma Center for the Humanities at the University of Tulsa. I'm Katie Moulton. I'm one of the 2019-2020 public fellows on the topic of play. I'm a writer and a music critic and also a 2019-2020 Tulsa Artist Fellow. I'm joined today by award-winning writer and musician Sarah Pinsker to discuss her novel, A Song for a New Day, and um, her writing and creative practice in general. Uh, the novel was published last year by Penguin Random House, but depicts presently a dystopian near future, now just our present day, where people and culture are shaped by a global pandemic. Uh, we're here to discuss the novel and Sarah's artistic practice, as well as the particularly precarious position of musicians and the role of play within it all. So I'll just introduce Sarah. Sarah Pinsker is an award-winning author based in Baltimore. Her short fiction has won Nebula and Sturgeon Awards and appeared in Asimov's and Fantasy and Science Fiction, as well as numerous other magazines and anthologies. She is a singer-songwriter who has toured behind three albums on various independent labels. Her first short story collection, Sooner or Later Everything Falls Into the Sea, was released in early 2019, and her first novel, A Song for a New Day, was released by Penguin Random House in fall 2019. She's the current writer in residence at Goucher College in Baltimore and is at work on her next novel, pretty much finished with it, uh, called We Are Satellites, due out in February 2021. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Hey. Hey. Thanks so much uh, for joining us in the midst of everything, both pandemic and also very exciting news for you because the Nebula Awards are next week and you are up for two in two categories. Two. So exciting. Um, will that be streamed? I think so. I think so. Uh, they've moved the whole, the whole uh, conference online and done a really good job of it. It's actually got like social aspects too. Speaking, oh, really? of, speaking of play, yeah, they've actually um, got a really cool conception of what an online uh, convention or conference can be. Uh, so, so I think that's definitely part of it. I'm very happy to hear that because I have a sense that all of these spring activities that we had planned that were postponed until the fall may exist virtually in any case. So it's nice to know that, um, that somebody is doing it well. Um, but I guess it makes sense that, that uh, you know, the science the fiction think writers about, would be on top. Yeah, that people who think about the future would have been planning it a little earlier. Uh, uh, the, the new president of the organization that runs that was, was very, uh, was adamant early on that we have that completely ready to go just in case. And so, yeah. That's yeah. great. Um, well, I was just saying, we were just talking um, that I picked up a song for a new day. Here it is. Um, at the very beginning of the pandemic, before we quite realized uh, the scale that it was going to to have um, and I got to hear you read from it in person, in real life, in a room with a bunch of people um, on March 10th and that was probably the last large gathering of that kind that I have been to. Um, and so I'd like to just uh, talk about that as an opening and where the novel opens because it begins in the moment just before everything changes. Um, so could you describe a little bit just about where we, where the, where the novel kicks off? The novel kicks off with one of the two main characters who is a touring musician, um, right on the cusp of some big things happening for her. Like it, uh, she has a song that's, that's taken off and, and she's starting to play bigger venues. She's starting to headline in, uh, instead of open. And, and it's right at that moment that, that things go bad and people are, are forced inside. So I wanted, I wanted a moment that was just before, like where everything was still feeling normal. And then I wanted the first big set piece of a concert to be one that, that, uh, happened for the musicians, but, but uh, that it was already, that, that was the moment where things were already going off the rails. Right, right. So there's a moment when, um, well, we should say that there is, a, 
there's a global pandemic that shifts the culture and and propels the story um but there's also um terror attacks that are happening sort of on a massive scale that right and, shut down large and, gatherings. right and in the book it's actually i think the focus is a little more on on that as, as one of as the reason that people stop gathering um that the government says it's safer not to gather and uh so so i, I mean the thing that i think is, is this the slight disconnect that, that that um that i did provide there is, is that the because of the terror attacks it actually people are going inside out of personal fear and trading their freedom for uh, for the perception of safety, which is not the same as people go uh, locking down in an act of solidarity uh, with uh, with healthcare workers and with the people who can't do that um, in order to to slow things and try to keep people safer. So, so there, it's not quite the same thing, but but I didn't. There's a bunch of there. There is pandemic as well as terror attacks so, and, and the two combined do result in a very locked down world. So, so I don't think I got it entirely wrong, but I, I like to give that caveat because a few people pushed back and said, well, you know, you, you're saying that lockdown is bad and, and that isn't what I was saying. I'm, I'm not, I'm not sympathizing with, with the protesters. Exactly. And these, you know, the sort of social terrors of sort of violence and then a global pandemic which feels sort of biological or outside of our control those things are like intricately connected right i mean it makes sense it doesn't feel like oh two catastrophes wouldn't happen at once it's like no like these things can snowball and feed on yeah, each other exactly. um but yeah you're right that um the one of your main characters loose cannon performs what's widely then considered to be the last rock show before, and, right. you know, before everyone retreats to their, their silos um, and relies on virtual communication. Um, and that's not, in the book, it's not an act of selfishness necessarily because there's no risk of, of spreading a disease at that point. Um, but it's really about, well, how would you describe that? Like that moment of, of deciding to play the show, you know, maybe they sold 2000 tickets, but 50 people, they decide to put it on and 50 people do show up and they play. Right. That, that was an act of, of solidarity with the people who did show up and, <laughs> and um, in defiance of, of terror. If people are saying, like, like they, were, they weren't looking at it as putting anyone at risk. They were saying these people are already here and um, we owe this to them and we will feel better for having done it collectively. Right. So uh, your novel, it, it goes back and forth. It follows two main characters. Um, and for a while too, there's sort of two timelines. There's the sort of before and there's the after and you're closer to that sort of dividing line as we move forward. Um, and you follow Luce Cannon, who's a professional musician on the brink of major success. Um, and then your other main character is named Rosemary. Um, and she is much younger, barely remembers the time when people could gather um, and has sort of come of age in a very socially isolated space. But she's still a music obsessed person like a person that music is extremely meaningful for and transporting um and so i wondered about those choices i mean granted they run parallel and then these characters intersect in important ways obviously um but to have the musician as one character and then a sort of fan or facilitator of music as the other main character um what were you thinking about in dramatizing that dynamic? I think I think that was there. There are a couple of dynamics at play. One is the one that you just articulated. One is the the person who had a strong sense of what came before and wanted to hold on to it, mm -hmm. um, versus someone who who grew up 
after things had happened and in a, in a very changed world and uh, didn't and, and saw good things about it as well as bad. Um, like if that's how you grow up, then, then, you know, you'll still, there are things that you're going to poke at and things you're going to uh, take issue with, but, but you'll also see some of the good sides. And so, so she was able to, to, to say some of that stuff that, that Luce could never see um, reasons why things weren't all wrong. And I wanted, I wanted some of those gray areas in there because I think that there are things that can come out of a big, a big shift mm -hmm. or a big change like this. Like you can either choose to go back to normal or you can acknowledge that normal is not perfect for everyone and, and that there are things you can change to make it better, that there are changes we're making right now temporarily that would also be positive in the long run. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, that's an important, important foil um, as the two characters move forward. Um, I was thinking about the scene that I heard you read in March, which I think was about um, Luce living in a group house and as, as they see the world changing in real time, um, making a list, keeping notes on um, don't forget normal. Is that, a, yeah. yeah that yeah, so to make a list of all the things that were part of their lives before that are inaccessible now, but to remind themselves over and over, wait, this is this is what our lives were like. This is what was important. This is what we want to do again someday. Um, and that list sort of expands from the refrigerator to taking up the walls um, of a whole living space. Um, yeah, and that's... Uh, when you read that, I was, I've been thinking about that a lot uh, in quarantine and then realizing though that, you know, we keep saying when all this is over, but when all this is over, like, is that really a thing? You know, will, does it actually go back to exactly the way it was? No, of course not. And so how do we take the things that we've realized were like part of the normal that we prioritize and bring them into what's next. Right. Yeah. And acknowledge that there are, there are things that, that we can see that we shouldn't unsee that, you know, that, that uh, having access, uh, I talked, I mentioned the conference at the beginning, you know, going online, that means that people who couldn't, didn't have the, the money or the time or, whatever to, to go to California for a weekend can actually be there, including some of the, you know, some of the nominees, including writers who would like to hear uh, panels on finances for novelists and, um, and how to sell translations and all these, these business things that they don't have access to because they couldn't make it there. So, so how do we, like some of those access questions um, apply to higher education as well um and to, to accessibility and and uh we can we can choose to go back exactly or we can say look at these things we've learned how can we incorporate these into a new normal absolutely yeah that's so important um circling back to music obsessed characters um could you talk a little bit about you're a musician yourself so there's a natural affinity and understanding for the sort of nitty gritty um, day to day and also like interior life of, of a person compelled to make music. But can you talk a little bit about um, deciding to focus on that world and focus on uh, musicians as characters in fiction? Um, I think I think part of it is because there I don't. I see there's, there are a few people who can get it right. And, and a lot of people who I read when I read fiction about music, and I'm sure it's the same for people who, read, who are dancers who read fiction about dance or, um, you know, civil war buffs, you know, if, when it's your thing, you get upset when someone gets it wrong. Um, but, but I love the challenge of, of translating music into a, a feeling on the page. And so that's part of it. And uh, Luce has, has been a really easy character for me to write. I had um, the, 
uh, I had a previous novelette, which is a, uh, we, we had talked before that the, we hit record about how novelette is this weird uh, category that exists in science fiction and fantasy between short story and novella. Uh, but I, I had a novelette called Our Lady of the Open Road, which was also about Luce. And um, I, it, it's like 15,000 words and I wrote it in one afternoon in a coffee shop. Uh, it was, I just found this voice and it worked. And uh, so when I started thinking about, oh, I should probably write a novel, I immediately turned to that voice and said, this is someone who I can write again. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so that was part of it. But I do, I love the challenge of trying to make people feel music on a page. Yeah, it's, um, my sense too was that writing about a musician, there's an inherent tension um, just in terms of between what they want to do and also having to have food and and live. And this is sort of, um, yeah, just sort of a natural tension that's always going to have to be negotiated um, in fiction. I mean, that's, that's propellant for me. Right, right. And, and that's always, a, you know, most musicians have to deal with that question of what, what do you do for art? And I apologize, my dog may bark in a second. Um, uh, what do you do for art? What do you, uh, where, what do you do to sustain yourself? Which things are you not willing to do? Um, all, all of those, all of those questions. And, and part of why I stopped making music full time it was because uh, I didn't want to do the gigs I didn't want to do anymore. But with the the stuff that um, play like playing in coffee shops where where the you know the machines are going off every two seconds and playing some of the places where people weren't engaged like like the best shows were always the ones where people actually want to listen to you and when you're in the background. Um, often those are the the better paying gigs, but they're not the ones that that give you any uh, artistic sustenance. Uh, so so uh, I actually I, I went to a conference where Patty Smith was the keynote, and um, she said two things that absolutely changed my life in that in that uh, in her keynote speech. One of which was people come up to her all the time and say, Patty, I've applied for every grant I've applied for, like I've done everything I can. um, And I'm just, you know, I'm not making it. I I don't know what to do. I want to make my art, but I I can't. And she said, get a job. Uh, And, and she said, you know, get a day job. There's no shame in a day job. And you'll, you may find that you're happier and more uh, artist uh, that your art may actually flourish because you're not worried the the idea of the starving artist and having to to be in pain in order to create um i, I think has always been a a, a pernicious myth mm. the other thing she said was go to the dentist um which which i think a lot of the musicians in the audience including me needed to hear because <laughs> when you don't have when you don't have good insurance you or you know like you don't go the dentist is an easy thing to put off and um, and she said, you only get one set of teeth. This is something I learned. Just, just suck it up, go to the dentist. Um, and those were two very, very useful pieces of information for me right at that moment in time. So. That's, it's incredible. Yeah. And, but also totally unsexy. And yeah. um, we don't necessarily think we want to read a novel that, that ends with the protagonist getting a job and going to the dentist. Right, but in the middle of the in the middle of the book, uh, Luce gets a job. She she uh, you know she's uh, I don't I don't know how much I never know what's a spoiler and what's not. But but there there's a time in her life where she does get a day job and um and but her the things that she's doing for music are are rich, uh, enriching and and the best that can be done in that circumstance and uh, in that moment. So, so I don't think she's less happy because of it. Right. Um, can you talk about um, where a story might begin for you or where, when you do happen upon a voice, how do you then follow that in through, through a series of events, through a plot? Uh, the, the plot side of things, um, 
often comes from a series of what if questions. Um, that that that's sort of the the central the central organizing feature of a lot of science fiction and fantasy. Mm -hmm. Like in fantasy, you get the you know what if dragons type of question, <laughs> and in science fiction, um, you get the what if um, pandemic. Uh, and, you know, and then and then you interrogate it. You say. Uh, who is going to be uh, harmed by this? You say, who would this benefit? Mm. Um, you say, um, what, um, who would this harm? Who would this benefit? Um, who gets left behind? Who, who um, takes advantage of it? You, you go through this whole series and, and, and look at those things and then maybe you choose one of those characters to, to hang the thing on. And then, and then you start saying, what are the human, lo for, for me, actually, I should say you, I keep saying you, but for me, I say, um, what are the human level things that I can hang this on? I'm, I'm not as interested in, you know, if I, I could write a, a big political book about what happened, you know, in the politics to make this stuff happen. But I was more interested in these apolitical characters who were, experiencing it and um and you know what advantages came out of it and and what what was damaged and all of those questions um so if you poke a, around what if and and then the personal questions of who 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 would benefit who would be harmed um you can usually find a story in there yeah that's a that's just sterling writing advice i think um even if you're not working in speculative fiction but that was my experience of the novel I, I like hearing you talk about like the you're thinking about who you know like you're finding your characters there and then the human level to hang things on because that was my experience in reading a song for a new day was we're thinking you know we're in sort of what we perceive as extreme global conditions and yet everything felt very realistic you know very like just and a lot of that is down to to details but a lot like most of that is the really um recognizable emotional interiority of the characters that are reacting to things big and small just the way that humans do um and so is that i mean obviously that's something that you're really paying attention to um, are you trying to also put characters in seemingly everyday situations for them to react within the sort of like larger? Yeah, yeah I don't, I mean, I, I don't do a whole lot of writing of great big huge set piece type things. I, right. I, I do like to see how it happens in the everyday and just play it out with characters. I think, I think um, that's, and and I think that's why I sort of ended up on the like the Berkeley Penguin Random House side of of that uh, publishing house instead of the the Ace uh, uh, side. They, they you know they have different areas that they can put your book into, and and I think um, if it if it had followed the technology more, then they probably would have put it under Ace. But because mm -hmm. it follows the people, they sort of shifted over and say this is a people story. And maybe um, hopefully the, the people who read speculative fiction will read it and also the people who don't will take a chance that that it won't, um, that they'll have the, the tools to read it. Because I think there's different toolboxes for reading different things. And I think I play with um, some of the tools from science fiction and some of the tools from, from the genre of literary fiction because they both have their own uh, paradigms yeah absolutely um it's a hard thing to do as a writer who sort of feels like i'm pulling from different modes of writing and try like because they you know if i'm writing personal narrative and from rock criticism but bringing them together because that's the best way for me to tell my story there's always the risk that someone's going to be like this is a hybrid i don't know about hybrid genre right Right, and you risk uh, alienating both instead of drawing in both. Like the goal is to draw in, and and but you could just create something that isn't readable for either. 
Yes, that is, that's the, uh, or just convincing people that like, no, you're, you're going to love it. <laughs> you're going to, you're going to love it. Um, just, yeah. So you do really focus on, um, like you said, a political characters, but of course, like their lives and their choices are inherently political yeah. throughout the book um, in, in big and small ways, big relative to their lives and their community and also small. Um, and I think that though we're living in a global pandemic right now, parts of your book that I think were most disturbing in sort of contemplating a future was how much like the period of fear and the like adjustment of social norms sticks and and warps um certain certain expectations of how we are together and apart and um like you said asking who benefits who takes advantage of this the sort of um the vacuum that maybe was left open by a government or by individual um individual endeavors and and like big corporations filling that vacuum and taking over that is terrifying me that's keeping me up um and yeah i just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that yeah i, I um i mean that I, I think that's probably my own politics bleeding in there too but but uh, i i think it's easy easy to imagine you know that in a situation like this where we're all um you know isolated in our homes and everything that 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 we would choose the things that are most convenient um and if we do that then we're going to lose a lot of the things that might not be convenient but are part of what what uh enriches our lives so so um the the local restaurant you know keeping local restaurants and coffee shops and bookstores going keeping local bookstores and uh and then the venues like you know i'm i am terrified for local venues that you know how do they sustain during this time period um and i've seen some that are doing some pretty creative stuff uh but but you know those things and then are people going to order from amazon because it's faster um, or are they going to, you know, take the time to, to seek out other places that might be selling the same thing where they might have to put in a little more effort or they might have to wait a little longer. Um, and if they don't, then is that going to be all that's left? And in the novel, like that's all that's left, um, on a macro scale. Um, and, and which is definitely my fear is bleeding out there, uh, that, that we could easily let that happen. We have to actively work against it. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, um, there's a way that sort of in terms of independent music venues and DIY art spaces and all access spaces, um, there's always sort of a shorter life cycle for them just by nature of the space that they occupy in a community. Um, but we're seeing that on, on a larger level, you know, every few years or something, of course, like the most popular DIY music venue in a city is shut down for whatever reason, because a new developer is coming in and suddenly that property that was once an abandoned warehouse is now extremely valuable. And the, the young people and the artists have to flow like water into the next place. Um, but this is affecting it on a sort of like, there's the fear that it will be, more devastating right and, and the the smallest places like the diy spaces the hope is you know they'll they're more adaptable like because it's not necessarily the space it's the people who are creating it at that level and they may be and because they don't have like usually a diy space doesn't have like staff you know they like a lot of times it's just um we've gotten hold of this basement that we're allowed to you you know like they're uh this this place that's a, a daycare by day it, like they let us like do shows in it at night or um, this arts you know this music studio this art studio whatever and so so there's a chance that some of those spaces will either still exist or they'll that group of people will find carve another space when when it's time but i think that that size that's right above that yeah. where um is 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 the one that, that you worry about that has staff who who aren't working right now or who have to find other things to do will they come back um like what what do you know sound people do right now 
um, what do, uh, how do they pay the rent? And, and if it's, you know, if it's big enough, they're going to have to, like, I worry that they're going to let it go. And then that particular type of venue, I think will be harder to get back. Um, so we'll, we'll end up with the extremes. We'll end up with the, the DIY basements and we'll end up with um, the, the big venue, corporate venues and there will be no, no in between. Yeah. Oh God, it's terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it is. And I've seen a couple of venues doing some kind of smart stuff like um, offering their space to bands who do want to do something right now since everyone's doing their thing on their own. But, but I think there's going to be a middle point where a band can come together, you know, like if they've all been isolating, they can all come together and play and someone can record them. Um, but they need a bigger space for that um, and better sound. And um, I, the Creative Alliance right before, uh, which is a Baltimore venue, sorry, um, uh, they, they've got a, a bunch of things going on, but, but one of the things they were doing right before the full lockdown was, um, you could pay, you could pay, uh, musicians to come serenade you in, on your street. And, uh, they would, the venue got a little of the money for setting it up and then the musician got some of it. And so stuff like that, but you know, there, there's some creative ways to get through this, but, but I think it's going to take a lot of that, um, to make it happen. Yeah, I've seen um, there's at least one venue in Tulsa that's been allowing sort of individual or small groups of performers to perform in their space with their engineer and then broadcasting that. Yeah, that's awesome. Which um, also reminded me of your novel <laughs> in a lot of ways. It's all in there. It's all in there. <laughs> it's all in there. Um, the the funny thing, there are a couple of things that are in there that I didn't remember writing because the the scale, you know, from uh, from the point where you where you submit the novel to the point where it actually comes out, there's year, you know, there's there's usually a, a, a fairly big gap, and there's little things that I forgot that I'd written. I did forget that I had said like everyone needs to wash their hands. Like like they said, we don't know what this disease is, but but they just keep telling us to wash our hands. I totally forgot that. And people have been sending me like little snippets of my own book that I don't remember. And I'm like, oh, go me. <laughs> well, it's all there. It's just good advice. It's just good. Yeah, advice. wash your hands. Um, well, so as a, as a creative person, as a person who is a musician and a writer and asking, like following these, these what if questions through your imagination, um, what is your relationship to, to play? Um, either in those spaces or sort of more generally um, thinking about music communities or creative communities? Uh, well, it's I think it's changed a little bit because there was a time when, when it was very, all right, what do I do to survive as a musician? I think I, had, I was missing a sense of play for a while that I, got, that I did get back when I started, uh, there was, when I took a day job and then when I started writing, uh, it freed music up to be something that was no longer a career and, and let me have fun with it again. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so I guess it's easier to think of play as a concept as a, as a musician than as a, as a writer, but I think I can, I can speak to both because as, as a musician, um, I always found that the way into songwriting was was just playing whatever came to my fingers like including like usually it would be a whole bunch of cover songs before i could finally find something that was original but but first first i had to play through the other stuff and and play as a way of connect connecting with musicians like you know uh for for folkies it's the you know the song circle and for for bands you know it's just like does this click does it not um do we play it 500 times or do we just like have fun with it as rough as it is, um, that kind of thing. Um, but, but finding those, those spaces where you can, um, be free to be imperfect. Mm. And, um, with writing, it's kind of a different thing. Uh, what I was thinking about when you said writing and play was actually all of the, all of these little playful techniques that I use, especially with students, but, but, um, sometimes with writing retreats and, and all these different ways to be a writer. Um, there's a retreat I used to go on where 
where um, over the course of the weekend, you know, we wrote and wrote. And then on Saturday night, we, we ended up doing these weird, like, uh, performative Twitter things where uh, we decided the house was, was attempting to murder us. I, th I think someone got locked. There was one year that someone got locked in a room, like, completely inexplicably. There wasn't even, there wasn't a lock on the door, like, like nothing worked to get her out. And it just seemed like it was the house that was, that was saying it. And then a couple of other weird things happened. And uh, uh, so, yeah, so, so I've been in like murder mysteries, like th th that kind of thing, like on where it's a whole bunch of professional writers who just, you know, dive into that idea. I know a lot of writers who do um, role-playing games. I don't, I don't do that, like uh, Dungeons and Dragons type stuff for fun but it's also a good writing exercise. Um, there are a bunch of board games that can free up mm. that kind of space. Um, a couple that I've used with my students, like, like as prompts or uh, in, in just uh, exquisite corpse type stuff where you write, you know, you start it and then you hand it to someone else and someone has to keep the story going. And I think, I think there's a lot of, there's more room for play than you think about when you've, like, like when you first post the idea, I was like, well, no, I did. I mean, I have the idea and I sit down and I write, but, but there's actually a lot of um, stuff that goes into that. Yeah, it's sort of, I like the, like making the space to, to be imperfect a lot, like changing the stakes so that you're not so invested in the final outcome, allows it to be fun, allows you to not strangle your impulses before you've had a chance to get anywhere because you're so worried about the outcome. But also it sounds like, um, you know, it's, it's related to limits. It's related to, okay, well, these are the songs that I know. These are the chords and my fingers are going to go somewhere naturally, but I'm not invested in an outcome. Um, or I'm using like the limits of an exquisite corpse or a board game to point me in a direction and we'll see what happens. Um, which I think definitely are all like, really playful endeavors. Um, and it's interesting that, you know, when you're playing a game, you do have a clear goal to win or to, you know, to follow certain steps and to vanquish your opponents. But if we're applying a similar theory to, to creative endeavors, the, the key is to not have a clear goal for a while until, you know, until you're like really embarked. Um, and and they're, both, they're both forms of play. It's interesting. Yeah can sort of flip on each other. Yeah. Um, well, let's wrap it up because we've talked so long and you have a million things to do. Um, but it was so lovely to speak with you. Thank you for sharing this quarantine time yeah. with us. Thank you for having me. Um, if you would like to read more of Sarah Pinsker's work, you can order your own copy of this nonfiction. <laughs> Um, a song for a new day. Order it uh, from Magic City Books in Tulsa or from bookshop.org. Um, you can also look at indiebound.org, which will point you to your local indie. And all those bookshops are opening back up or doing curbside um, delivery now. So no excuse. Order from an indie. Um, her story collection is also available and you'll have to wait until February 2021 for the new novel. Um, but you can also find excerpts of your work, I believe, maybe online, a couple of places. Yeah, and, and there's a, a bunch of stories that are That's online great. that aren't in the collection. Oh, great. Um, well, thank you again to Sarah Pinsker and from the Oklahoma Center for the Humanities and University of Tulsa. This has been Fridays with the Fellows. Uh, take care, Sarah, and we'll talk to you soon.